Three months in the nut. Welcome to the Twisted Metal Iceberg, where I will take this long list of facts, trivia, and interesting tidbits about everyone's favorite car combat game, Twisted Metal, and present them in order of descending obscurity, which is a pretentious way of saying that the further down we get on the iceberg, the less likely it is for most people to know what we're talking about. I used an iceberg made by someone who shared it to Reddit and then deleted their account, so I actually don't know who it was, so shout out to this mystery iceberg architect. I added a few of my own entries that I felt should have been there and took out others that seemed unnecessary or redundant. Twisted Metal Harbor City was meant to be the sequel to Twisted Metal Black, but was cancelled around three quarters of the way through development, by some accounts only one week after it entered alpha. It's never been officially confirmed what the reason was for canning this game so late into its production, but we will talk about a few theories later on in the iceberg. What we do know about its development is that it began its life at Incog Inc., the same studio that brought us Twisted Metal Black and Small Brawl. However, Harbor City would be brought up without the leadership and guidance of David Jaffe, as he would go on to work on God of War at Sony Santa Monica. Instead, Scott Campbell and the rest of the team at Incog would embark on the production journey themselves and take some pretty bold swings for a franchise that's always kept its scope contained to simple car combat action. Harbor City would try its hand at a linear narrative that follows Sweet Tooth and his escapades through an open world. It would even feature on-foot sections where you can take direct control of the iconic demon clown and even the preacher. The only remnants of these ideas are a few scattered screenshots around the internet and what we find within the extra twisted edition of Twisted Metal Head On, but we'll talk about that plenty as we go down the iceberg. Congratulations! You have won my contest. Welcome to my home. The lost endings of Twisted Metal are the cut live-action movies that were meant to be in the original Twisted Metal way back in 1995. What instead appears in the final release are walls of scrolling text that explain the goings-on of your character once they finish the tournament. The planned endings for the game were meant to be live-action, and to our great fortune, we actually have access to see what those endings would have been. We want this? Yeah. Stop. Each character is seen driving into Calypso's dank underground compound, where the big man himself is flanked by shirtless men and scantily clad women. The winning driver gets out of their car and demands their prize. Chaos usually ensues. These endings are astonishingly campy. The amount of cheese on tap here is enough to make Wisconsin sweat. A few standouts from these endings include Sweet Tooth, where he rolls in with his ice cream truck looking like a full-on lunatic. Like this dude would have been standing out on the beach at 2am, hanging hog and cackling at the night sky if it wasn't for this whole car combat tournament. He brought a plus one, a woman who's tied up in his passenger seat, and who could not be more done with his shit. Sweet Tooth desperately pleads for his prize from Calypso, and he delivers. With the press of a button, out comes a paper bag, who turns out to be Sweet Tooth's best friend and closest companion. Crazy Harold the Wacky Lunch Sack. He then shoots up the joint before getting his truck commandeered by the woman who was tied up. It's just utter bonkery all around. There's also Yellow Jacket's ending, where Charlie Kane clanks in with his rusty taxi and hook hand, hoping that Calypso can give him the chance to keep on driving. Charlie receives a mysterious red potion and gulps it with little hesitation. Oh, that's strange. It tastes like... Skip it a button, Dada! Sounds good to me, baby! He'll continue to drive as a ferryman for Calypso's game. And how could we forget about Darkseid, who is driven by the literal devil? They clearly couldn't afford to have an actual semi-truck to park in the garage, so instead it's just depicted as a couple of headlights casting an atmospheric glow around Mr. Ash, who just wants his best demon back. Calypso begs for him not to take Black away. It falls on the deaf ears of Mr. Ash, who just sucks Black into a Folgers coffee tin. It looks so bad, the whole thing. These endings are comedy gold. The only reason why we know these endings exist is because they were included as part of the extra twisted edition of Twisted Metal Head On, among a few other bonus features that we'll be discussing further down the iceberg. Twisted Metal Black is a game that, like onions, ogres, and a stylish winter outfit, has layers. On the surface, it's a riveting, fast-paced car combat title that delivers edge-of-your-seat action that few other games can match. Going a bit deeper, it also offers a series of well-executed horror short stories, with the various drivers and their journeys through the dark, bitter world of Twisted Metal Black. Going a bit deeper still, the game hides a major twist that's revealed only when you progress through the game as Minion. 
who you unlock after beating the game with every other character. Where normal drivers have inner monologue that displays during the loading screen, Minion presents a series of coded messages that, when translated, read, I do not think this is real. I must speak in code or he will discover me. We are trapped in his head. This is how he sees the world, how Sweet Tooth sees his life. It is not real. All of us are trapped in his head. I miss the old colorful world. We will return to our world one day. In the real world, my name is Marcus Kane. This is the first time in a Twisted Metal game that it was mentioned there's a connection between Marcus and Needles Kane, suggesting that they are two warring psyches within the same body, each vying for control over Sweet Tooth. These messages completely flip on its head how we understand Black and its world. This game isn't just a dark adaptation of the old Twisted Metal, like slapping a sinister coat of paint on a beloved and familiar franchise just for shock value. This world is a specific brand of darkness. It's the representation of a broken, twisted psyche inside the mind of a serial killer clown. Every character afflicted with the dark disease, every environment crumbling under the weight of unchecked evil, every ounce of chaos is the result of Needles Kane taking the reins away from Marcus to fully commandeer Sweet Tooth. And depending on your interpretation, either Needles is projecting his own dark perception onto the real world as some kind of elaborate hallucination, or he is imagining the world of Twisted Metal Black entirely. Nine Eight Nine Studios is the team that brought us such masterpieces as Twisted Metal 3 and 4. See, after the release of Twisted Metal 2, the original development team at Singletrack was bought out by GT Interactive and were no longer able to work on Twisted Metal. While Singletrack went on to create Rogue Trip Vacation 2012, a spiritual successor to Twisted Metal, Sony still needed their first party cash cow car combat series to have a new entry within the year and chose Nine Eight Nine Studios, most likely only because they were available and had recently developed developed a driving game called Rallycross. So the daunting task of building a game engine was already taken care of. 989 Studios were forced into the unenviable position of continuing an established and beloved game franchise while at the height of its popularity, just as its competitors were also reaching their peaks like Vigilante 8 and Interstate 76. Sure they had their own game engine, so that pain in the dumper was out of the way, but they still didn't have the engine that Twisted Metal 2 used, which most people consider to be the greatest assembly of code to ever exist. No matter what game engine they used for Twisted Metal 3, it likely could never reach the heights of Twisted Metal 2 for that reason alone. Meaning all of the leaps forward that were made from the original game to its sequel would have to be replicated and improved upon from scratch in only a matter of months. Despite the tough position 989 Studios was forced into with a tight production schedule, the game they ended up with was reasonably successful commercially, earning itself a greatest hits label. Twisted Metal fans seem to be split on whether Twisted Metal 3 and 4 are great versions of the game, or if there's sore spots on the franchise. No matter what your opinion of the game is, you'd have to admit that it's hard not to consider it at the very least an admirable effort from a studio that had every reason to burst into flames, based on the scenario they were in with developing this game. They were able to ship a fully featured Twisted Metal game just in time for the holiday season of 1998 and 99. Sweet Tour is a bonus game mode that was included as part of the extra twisted edition of Twisted Metal Head On, the game that keeps on giving apparently. Sweet Tour remains the only time in the history of this franchise that a player is able to take control of something that isn't made of metal and the twisting therein. Instead, we assume the role of guiding Sweet Tooth and his fleshy meat sack through the halls of the Blackfield Asylum. Throughout the complex are factoids that dispense interesting facts and trivia about the development and history of Twisted Metal throughout the years. Sweet Tooth's animations are janky and crude, but it's still an awesome experience to slow the game down and use the clown boy for more than just destruction. The Kane family refers to the bloodline that runs throughout the entire series of Twisted Metal. It's tricky to nail down the relationships in every game because oftentimes one entry doesn't necessarily connect to the others in a simple or neat way. So this is what we know about the members of the Kane family. The most important member of the Kane family is obviously Needles Kane, the clown known as Sweet Tooth and the driver of the ice cream truck. His alter ego Marcus Kane is usually shown as the driver of Roadkill, but was also the driver of Minion in Twisted Metal Black. Charlie Kane is Needle's father and only appears in Twisted Metal 1, 2, and Black. 
He is the driver of Yellow Jacket in the first game, in black, but is behind the wheel of Darktooth in Twisted Metal 2, possibly as a result of his ending in the first game, when he became Calypso's wheelman. Needles also has an unnamed brother in Twisted Metal Black, who is a mechanical savant responsible for turning Charlie Kane, the father, into a remote-controlled zombie after he was slain in cold blood. In Twisted Metal 2012, we see even more members of the Kane family that do not appear in any other game. That game shows Marcus Kane was once a simple suburban man with a family, a job selling ice cream, and a nice home. He had a wife and several kids. The wife goes unnamed as far as I can tell, but two of the kids are shown to be Sophie Kane and Charlie Kane. Sophie Kane is the target of Sweet Tooth's story, where after Marcus fully converted to the serial killer clown, his first targets were Marcus's family. Sophie was the only one to survive, and Sweet Tooth's mission is to find her and finish what he started. It's revealed in multiple post-credit cutscenes that Sophie Kane was resurrected by Calypso to become Sweet Chick. Following that, we see that Sweet Tooth, Twist, intentionally left his son to survive too, just in case he needed someone to take up the mantle of toothing. After the events of Twisted Metal 2012, it's implied that Sweet Tooth perished, but his son will take over in order to do battle with Sweet Chick or something. This one is simple. In the PAL version, as in the European release of Twisted Metal Black, all of the cutscenes and movies were completely removed from the game. Sony decided that the movies would need to be censored heavily in order to be sold in many of the European countries. And rather than spend the money to edit or redo certain scenes, they just axed the whole thing. They figured that the game wouldn't sell well outside of North America anyway, so why spend the money to accommodate the European market? However, the credit sequence of the game still shows a montage of the cutscenes that were supposed to appear in the game. Seems like teasing, but okay. Not only that, but the loading screen dialogues were also removed from the game. The PAL version had no story whatsoever, so it's a good thing there's YouTube, so that the rest of the world can actually experience the best parts of Twisted Metal Black. Another simple one. Twisted Metal 2012 was meant to have a few pieces of DLC, including adding the colorful IndyCar Twister. It's unclear why these were never released, as they supposedly were nearly complete. There are even some highly detailed renders available online showing what could have been. DM2012 was subject to extremely poor post-launch support, headlined by the departure of David Jaffe, who just up and left the studio Eat Sleep Play as soon as the game released. It's really a shame. Crazy 8 was one of the best vehicles in Twisted Metal Black, and it would have been amazing to see in Twisted Metal 2012. Twisted Metal Revolution is one of a couple ideas that were thrown around about how Twisted Metal should make its triumphant return to the PS3. The concept of Revolution would have taken the traditional Twisted Metal approach and turned it into a midnight club or fast and furious type of affair, with roving street racing gangs driving highly modified cars around neon lit cities. The game would have gone down a more realistic and grounded road, instead of the more whimsical and fantastical style of the other games. This never really got past the concept stage as the team just couldn't come up with enough good ideas around the setting and aesthetic. Some concept art does exist on the internet, and a few of the ideas did make their way into what became Twisted Metal 2012, including the faction system where each one of the characters were the leaders of their own group, and the way vehicles would have a driver and a gunner who can lean out the window and use all kinds of weapons. Twisted Metal Apocalypse was another scrapped concept for the series. This would have seen Twisted Metal take on a devastated US following some sort of disaster, probably nuclear. The only thing that exists around this idea is some concept art showing Sweet Tooth wearing a gas mask and some blurry renders of Mount Rushmore and a city in disrepair. This was canned early on because the team decided that half the fun of Twisted Metal is getting to destroy the environment yourself, and having an arena that's already in rubble would remove that fun. The release of Motorstorm Apocalypse probably didn't help either. The Dark Past documentary was a 30-minute documentary where many of the prominent people behind Twisted Metal gave their story and insight on what it was like working on this legendary franchise. The other uh, interesting comment that the Japanese had uh, uh, a request to switch the weapons out for uh, in instead of firing missiles firing uh, food groups like vegetables and fruit. It was included as part of the extra Twisted Edition of Twisted Metal Head On. It's worth a watch and is available on YouTube in its entirety, and I recommend you go watch it. I'll put the link in the description. 
David Jaffe is the renowned auteur mind behind the Twisted Metal series, among other extremely popular titles such as God of War and Mickey Mania. He's often considered to be the main creative force who brought us everything we love about Twisted Metal. These days, he spends his time as a YouTuber, where he unloads his hot, crusty meme lord takes. Jokes aside, Jaffe seems like an incredibly thoughtful and great dude, so really all the best to him and his paid live streams. On the Paris level of Twisted Metal 2, if you go into the art museum section of the map and lob a napalm at the Mona Lisa, the painting will burn up and reveal a special hidden code. Exciting, except that it doesn't work. No matter where you try to input that code, it will never do anything in this game. That's because it's actually a typo. The up and down arrows are switched. If you input the correct code on the level select screen, you unlock a secret arena. Darkseid was originally planned to appear in Twisted Metal 2, but was cut for unknown reasons. The only thing we know about what would have been is some sketches of Darkseid and its driver Granny Dark, an old lady wielding a machine gun. Darkseid can only be briefly seen on the opening scene when you start the game. Don't worry though, the cranky old lady joke still made its way to the series as the driver of Hammerhead in Twisted Metal 3. In Twisted Metal Black, there were a number of cutscenes that were meant to be much, much darker in their original concepts. For instance, Agent Stone, the driver of Outlaw, in the final release, was responsible for the accidental killing of an innocent family. The reason for his grave error is that his blue-blooded cop rage got the better of him. Bad guys just make him so angry. But in the beta version, his reason was much more believable, in my opinion. Originally, his story showed that he was the victim of a horrific, racially motivated attack that saw his home and his family be consumed by fire. His grave error was caused by him losing control when he was presented with that same group of people that took his family when he was just a child. It had been over 30 years, but I could still see the house burning. Dollface's story also got a slight change from the beta version to the final release. Originally, she was locked away behind her mask, condemned to wear this face of porcelain by her father, not her boss. She was also meant to be much younger. In the beta version, she was around 10 to 12 years old, but is college-aged in the release version. Some artifacts of her original design are still present in the game, as her voice lines at certain points are much closer to that of a young girl than a woman in her 20s. I was a bad girl one time, and now I'm gonna pay for what I did forever and ever and ever. In my opinion, no story was more messed up than what was shown in the original version of Preacher's story. The story itself wasn't much different, where in both versions, Preacher mistook a baptism for an exorcism and ended up, um, well, it's hard to describe this in terms that won't get me in trouble, but he drowned him. In the final version, it's not shown, it's just implied. But the beta version, it's shown in graphic detail. For obvious reasons, it had to be cut from the game. But to this day, David Jaffe still claims that he is upset that they had to remove that. He calls it a beautiful scene. Speaking of Jaffe as being a crusty edgelord, he has said in multiple interviews and statements that his characters of Sweet Tooth and Kratos from God of War are representations of who he truly is on the inside. Oh Jesus, when I, when I saw the Sweet Tooth character design for three and then four, which was worse, I mean, he looked like a Carney Barker with these stupid... Uh, neon purple pants and and it's like what is this sweet tooth is like like I've said sweet tooth is me sweet tooth is the darkest most animalistic side of me and you guys are turning him into a f joke they are expressions of his inner rage and raw masculine power I get it that good art should be able to do that to be an outlet for your inner self that can be shared with the world but that does not make it any less cringe dude sorry Jaffe the only official information we've ever gotten directly about Harbor City is in the extra Twisted edition of Twisted Metal Head On, which gave players the first glimpse at what could have been Twisted Metal Black Part 2 by allowing them to play on four different levels that were meant to appear in Harbor City. This extra game was titled Twisted Metal Lost, and upon opening it from the menu, you are immediately shown a wall of scrolling text that explains just what the fuck is going on. It describes a tragedy about a group of key developers for Twisted Metal Harbor City, having lost their lives in a plane crash during a ski trip to celebrate a development milestone. With the most important members of the team perishing, the game had no choice but to be lost with them. 
Twisted Metal Lost goes on to spin a tale about this mysterious letter that was sent to Sony's office one day, urging the fat cats in corporate suits to release their work to the world and let everyone see what they were working on. That letter was signed with the names of the deceased developers. Sony abided by the wishes of the ghost devs, and that is supposedly why this is included as part of the extra Twisted Edition. It's a nice story, right? Tragic, but understandable why Black 2 never materialized in any meaningful way. The only problem is that the story is complete, grade A, USDA approved, free range bovine shit. Fake. Hoax. There was no plane crash that killed several key developers, thankfully. So if not that, why was Harbor City canned? There are a number of reasons people have come up with over the years, like that it was scrapped in favor of what became head-on for the PlayStation Portable, that Sony forced the team at Incog to pivot from their magnum opus in order to focus on having something ready for the launch of the handheld console. This has been largely debunked as head-on was being worked on alongside Harbor City when it was scrapped, so it's unlikely that Sony would decide to waste all that effort and time that brought the game that far into production just to move resources to a different, less marketable game. Another Another theory is that Harbor City was a bite too big for the developers to chew, and so despite their ambition, the game just never came together the way they wanted and just wasn't very good. The closest thing we have to legitimate information is from a developer who worked on Harbor City, whose name is Chad Liddell, mentioning in a Tumblr post that Twisted Metal Black Part 2 was cancelled the week after it entered Alpha, because Sony decided that a game in the post-GTA world couldn't be profitable without an on-foot component. The rumors of the game having sections where the player would be outside of their vehicle were added in last minute in an effort to save the project, but it wasn't enough. Chad Liddell also assures us that everyone from that Incog crew is alive and well, with many landing safely on development teams over at Disney. While this may not be official word from Sony, it's the closest we have to answers on what happened to Twisted Metal's most mysterious and ambitious game that never was. In the RC spin-off title Twisted Metal Small Brawl, the iconic character Axel was included on the roster, but was not given a story. In fact, the only time we see the kid controlling Axel is in the opening cinematic where he's being kicked down a hill in his wheelchair by Billy Calypso. He also briefly makes an appearance here when the kids are driving their RC cars around the playground. So why did the developers go through all the effort of designing a driver for Axel only to not have him show up anywhere else in the game? Well actually, at one point, Axel was meant to have an ending, but it was cut from the game late in development. The cut ending is available on YouTube in its entirety, and I'll show it here now. Pay up, Calypso! You said you could make me walk! Alright, alright! Keep your shorts on! So, how do I make him go? You don't. Yard work. <laughs> According to the game's lead designer and creator David Goodrich, the ending was cut by Sony because they decided that it would be offensive to people with disabilities, as it may have implied that being handy capable is a bad thing that someone would want to change about themselves if given the chance. By the way, Dave Goodrich has a YouTube channel where he streams and posts great videos and insight about his experiences as a game developer. So please go go check him out. This is another simple one. Twisted Metal was not the first name the team had for their car combat series. They toyed around with a couple of other names before landing on what we know of today. Urban Assault and High Octane were two of the most prominent names they came up with, with High Octane sticking with the game pretty late into production. And the lost endings that we talked about earlier still had Calypso calling his contest the High Octane Tournament. Let it be recorded that on this night, December 24th, 2005, Officer Carl Roberts is granted a world free of the high octane competition. One of my favorite discarded names was the straightforward title Cars and Rockets. Yeah, it makes you wonder why that didn't catch on. In Twisted Metal Small Brawl, the vehicle Darkseid was planned to have a driver that went by the name Jimmy Ash. His relation to Mr. Ash, who again is the literal devil, is unknown. All that remains of his cut character is a piece of concept art showing a kid wearing a devil mask. 
the iconic pink lowrider Thumper was planned to appear in Twisted Metal Black. Very little is known about it, but some concept art does exist that shows a black lowrider style vehicle with graffiti covering its exterior. The reason it wasn't added into black was apparently the developers couldn't come up with a driver and story that fit the world and vibe they were going for, so they just scrapped the car altogether. Sweet Tooth has had his fair share of appearances outside of Twisted Metal, in a way that no other character from the series has. Clearly, Sweet Tooth is the biggest pop culture contribution that Twisted Metal has ever had. He appears in a golf game as a playable character. He appears in War of the Monsters as a skin for one of the characters. He appears in Starhawk as a skin for one of the factions. He appears in PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale as a playable character. Back when Twisted Metal 1 was going ahead with its live action cutscenes, there were also a bunch of other live action scenes that were made for the game, including this subplot that follows a group of no good hoodlums who went by the name Apocalypse 9, causing chaos throughout the city. They would eventually steal an experimental military vehicle known as the XJ-39 mine tank that was said to be faster and more maneuverable than any other vehicle on earth because it could be directly controlled by the driver's brain, using their greatest desires and fears to become the most dominant metal twisting machine ever made. The devs were pretty ambitious with what they wanted to do with the XJ-39 mine tank. They planned to have a looping video playing on the side of the tank that shows what I can only describe as absolute fucking chaos. <laughs> It was supposed to be the representation of what was going on in the driver's mind as they commanded the tank around the battlefield. This was all eventually scrapped from the game, and all that was left was the tank itself, which we now know as Minion. Apocalypse 9 would have used the XJ-39 mine tank to enter Twisted Metal and get their wish, and they've never been mentioned ever again in the franchise. Twisted Metal Black released in June of 2001, and was a masterful statement to the world that Twisted Metal and Car Combat was back and more mature and gritty than ever. The game was very close to not being either of those things. When David Jaffe, Scott Campbell, and the rest of the team at Incog Inc. assembled once again to work on a new Twisted Metal game for what at the time was the far more powerful PlayStation 2, they had a choice to make. Do they stick to what worked in the mid-90s and just play the hits? Or do they go a dramatically different direction with pitch black horror as their guiding force? We know now what we ended up getting. It was the scary one with Twisted Metal Black. But had they gone down the more traditional Twisted Metal route, it would have been called Twisted Metal Road Trip USA, and gone down a much more colorful and playful route that draws a lot of cues and inspiration from classic Americana culture, as players would travel across the United States to do battle in many of America's most well known landmarks. Sweet Tooth would have dressed up as Uncle Sam. It would have been a grand old time that the Founding Fathers would have been proud of. The final boss of Twisted Metal Black, Warhawk, is not only a humongous pain in the dongus, he was also at one point planned to be a playable vehicle. Obviously, being a helicopter, Warhawk would have been a massive change-up to include on a roster full of ground-based vehicles, one that the developers struggled to overcome as it was far too difficult to balance the gameplay and arenas to accommodate for a full-ass fucking flying machine. They just couldn't keep Warhawk from flying out of bounds constantly. The character selection screen actually does have a slot made for Warhawk and even has a model for its pilot, Black Razor. Some savvy players were able to cobble together a working version of Warhawk. It's janky as hell, but it does exist and it does work. Twisted Metal Small Brawl as we know it today is a more kid-friendly iteration of everyone's favorite car combat series. Instead of the full-size death machines rumbling around a battlefield, laying waste to each other with big guns, big missiles, and even bigger explosions, Small Brawl features remote-controlled toys being directed by children around typical suburban venues like playgrounds, kitchens, and high school football fields. The idea is that the older teenagers and adults would be playing the much more dark and mature Twisted Metal Black, while the younger kids would need some way to get their Twisted Metal fix too, so Sony decided to task Incog Inc. with developing the RC spin-off that would appeal to that younger crowd. However, if we take Jaffe's story as truth, 
the Tiny World version of Twisted Metal was his idea, and he wanted it to be this rated R, raunchy romp around a suburban neighborhood, like some sort of 80s teen comedy type beat. Jaffe says he was inspired by a Japanese game called Mr. Mosquito that had a similar vibe. Not only that, but David Goodrich, Small Brawl's lead designer, has said that Small Brawl was originally planned to release for the PlayStation 2, but was later downgraded to PlayStation 1, so as to not eat into the sales of Twisted Metal Black, since they released the same year. Plus, Sony figured that the player base they were targeting were far more likely to have PlayStation 1s as hand-me-down consoles, while their older siblings and parents would be playing on the new or more powerful PlayStation 2. Despite Harbor City never getting an official announcement from Sony, there actually was a short teaser trailer produced for the game, which I'll show you here right now. It's just a simple teaser, but it has a cool vibe to it and makes me all the more annoyed that we never got Harbor City to see what they could have come up with. Speaking of trailers, one of the promotional materials for Twisted Metal Black features this weird oddity. This trailer, for the most part, is your standard garden variety montage action scenes to show off the intensity of the gameplay and visuals, but there's this quick shot where you can clearly see Sweet Tooth just fucking flying, cruising the friendly skies. It's never acknowledged anywhere, it's just there. But it's just strange that they included this shot in the trailer. Twisted Metal is a series that has been seemingly allergic to a consistent story or lore. Every game seems to exist almost entirely on its own, with almost no regard for the other entries. There is slight continuity between Twisted Metal 1, 2, and Head On, but otherwise the only thing shared between games is the title on the cover, the basic premise of a tournament run by Calypso, and the characters that appear. It should be no surprise then that there is no canon winner across the games. The closest one we have is Outlaw from Twisted Metal 1 to 2, where the original driver of Outlaw, Carl Roberts, was launched into space as a result of his wish being worded poorly. In the next year's contest, Twisted Metal 2, his sister takes the wheel as Outlaw 2, and enters in order to save her brother. Twisted Metal 3 and Head On each have their own way of continuing this story, with TM3 opting for complete nonsense, and Head On having the sibling cop duo confront Calypso, only to have it go horribly wrong. I wish you'd just shut up! Granted. What? <laughs> Outside of that, there is no canon winner of these games. The best way to think of the series is that each game and their characters exist in their own universe where those events happen. For instance, Sweet Tooth in TM2 is in a universe where he wins and becomes a bug, but his version in TM3 is in a universe where he is just a joke and they have nothing to do with each other. Before the release of Twisted Metal 2, a limited print Twisted Metal 2 comic was published, and it details the origins of Calypso. The story goes that Calypso was once just a kid who had this horrific hobby of collecting roadkill animals. One day, he saw a snake that he has been waiting to get a hold of, and decides to get behind the wheel of his dad's car that was parked in the driveway. He unset the brake and began to roll the car backwards, but didn't see that his little sister had been playing just behind the car. Having made a horrible mistake, the guilt and pain of what he did slowly set in. The gears and pulleys of his psyche turned to aching grinders, making every moment awake painful and miserable. He took his little sister's doll and pretended that it was her. He couldn't bear what he did, deciding it was only right that he joined his sister in the afterlife. He desperately tried to create some auto accident that would ferry him to the underworld, but his luck never seemed to run out, unlike everyone else surrounding his destruction. He finds himself eventually running away from home with his little sister's doll in tow, and taking work as a repairman at a demolition derby outfit. The way Calypso would beat the metal back into shape with rhythmic hammer strikes is what earned him his name. His boss, drunk on whiskey, gave him that name and urged him to beat metal in American next time because whiskey is a demon's drink. The next morning, his boss was sorry for the trouble and decided to make it up to Calypso by giving him a spot on the roster for the next Demolition Derby events. Calypso used the opportunity to finally be taken to hell where he belongs, but despite his death wish, he just kept on winning and walking away unscathed. 
He kept traveling along the derby circuit, hoping one of them would be the one that takes him out. His winnings earned him all the money and attention that he could want, leading him to get married and have a child. But he didn't see himself as much of a husband or a father, and would cheat on his wife and neglect his daughter constantly. His wife, catching him cheating, shouted that she hoped Calypso would just die already, to which he agreed. Later at one of his demolition derbies, it was his wife who got turned in when a wheel came free from one of the cars and bounced up into the stands. Calypso continued his path of self-destruction and didn't care who he took with him, even his own daughter. One night, he's visited by the vengeful spirit of his wife, who says that she's been in hell and it's him who should be there with her. Once again, Calypso agrees. He says all he has done is try, but nothing has worked. His wife told him that's because all he has to do is stop driving. Take your hands off the wheel and let it take care of itself. So he plunges his car directly into a brick wall, sending him to where he's been wanting to go all this time. Entering the underworld, he finds himself face to face with Minion, the tank driving demon and final boss of Twisted Metal 1, who gives Calypso the lowdown on how this whole thing is going to happen. Minion is going to chase and destroy Calypso, and when he does, he'll hang him from his mirror for a few hundred thousand years or until he gets bored of him. Calypso starts driving, dodging and evading everything that Minion threw his way, until finally, Calypso's vehicular fortitude was so strong that it caused Minion to drive off of Hell's many cliffs or whatever. This otherworldly display of driving skill granted Calypso an audience with the devil himself. It turns out the devil was actually a pretty big fan of the demolition derbies and wishes that hell could get their hands on better drivers. But all the best ones, like Calypso, just don't die very often. So he offers Calypso a chance to return to Earth so that he can gather the world's best drivers and have them compete in a brand new demolition derby, the Twisted Metal Tournament, designed to send the losers to hell to be enjoyed by the devil and grant the winner any wish their hearts desire. But Calypso likes to arrange for the winners to be sent to hell on occasion too, twisting their wishes in devilish ways. We talked further up in the iceberg about how a few of the characters in Twisted Metal Black had their stories and cutscenes changed from the beta stage to the final release. But we didn't talk about how the character selection screen was unchanged throughout that entire process, meaning that many of the drivers still kept their early models or versions from before their cutscenes were altered. Some of the differences are obvious, as what they look like when you're picking a vehicle looks nothing like they do in the cutscenes. Agent Stone looks like a completely different dude and missing his helmet, and No Face looks way more terrifying in the vehicle selection screen. Sweet Tooth was lifting weights and buff when they took his picture for the selection screen, but put on a few pounds for the cutscenes, among a few other drivers who were much different from one version to another. There exists on the internet this very strange video of Sweet Tooth. It's eerie and ominous and unclear what the context is. Supposedly, it's one of the endings that were meant to appear in Harbor City, but that's speculation. I don't know what this is. In the sewers level of Twisted Metal Black, which is only available in the multiplayer mode, there is a wall hidden around the map that has no collision, and driving into it will have you enter a short hallway, where at the end is this giant picture of a baby. Presumably it's one of the developer's children, and the same picture can be found in an early build of Twisted Metal Small Brawl on the Holiday Havoc Arena. It's a heartwarming easter egg from a proud parent who wanted to immortalize their child in the code of one of the darkest games to ever release on the PlayStation 2. Early in development for Twisted Metal Black, some of the vehicles that were featured in the game had wildly different designs and names. The best example of that is Crazy 8, the old-timey red stock car with the Taser Special, was originally planned to be Outlaw. The Outlaw that appears in the game was originally Warthog, which fits the militarized nature of Warthog throughout the series. Warthog in the final game was at first known as White Knight, and for those curious, the driver of White Knight was named Marv, and I don't know why they didn't just keep that. The Art of Twisted Metal was a booklet that was included with new copies of Twisted Metal Head-On Extra Twisted Edition, and featured a ton of artwork from throughout the series. Thankfully, even though the book is rare and hard to come by in physical form, some absolute chads were kind enough to upload most of the material to the internet, but not the book as a whole, as most of the concept art is scattered across various sites. The only piece of story or narrative that we have about what could have been Harbor City is this brief storyboard cutscene called Becker's Island. I'll just show the video in its entirety because words can't fully capture how fucking creepy and upsetting this is. 
And shout out to the Game Deviant on YouTube for uploading this and the mask test. Hidden within the suburbs map in Twisted Metal Black is a number of hidden details that most players wouldn't notice on their first playthrough. Many of the buildings throughout the landscape have unique music or audio attached to them. For example, the strip club plays strip club music. Benny's Restaurant, a reference to Mr. Grimm's best friend who he was forced to eat, will play a country song. The Asylum on the Hill will have the screams of its patients filling its halls. The shopping center on the far end of the level will have a distorted voice over the PA telling you all about the great deals going on that day. But the most disturbing audio can be found when you drive near the houses around the neighborhood. Most of the sounds you hear coming from the houses are just simple things like dogs barking or the TV playing the local news. But one audio file in particular, known as the Hood SFX, depicts something much darker. You can hear the sounds of a domestic violence incident taking place in a way that seems to go a little too far, even for a game as messed up as Twisted Metal Black. I'll play the sound for you here, but please, viewer discretion is advised. Leading up to the release of Twisted Metal Black, there was tons of money thrown around by Sony's marketing department in their effort to promote the game and get people to buy it. Most of this was for commercials and trailers that would appear on television or various other platforms. But one unique piece of media that was commissioned for was a series of so-called webisodes that showed off some of the characters from the game going about their antics across Midtown. There are videos for No Face, Billy Ray Stilwell, Dollface, Mr. Grimm, and of course, Sweet Tooth. Each one is delightfully horrific, in a way that only Twisted Metal Black could be. They are all available on YouTube for your viewing pleasure, and I recommend giving them all a watch if you haven't seen them already. On to the last entry, and this is a weird one. In Twisted Metal Black, a few of the vehicles have alternate special weapons. Axel can fold in on himself and become the wheels of death, Crazy 8 can charge up his electricity, and Raven can pop out of the top of her car and shoot a turret. However, Raven is hiding another version of her alternate special, one that has her emerge from her car wearing only her undergarments. I'm not a prude or have any problem with nudity in gaming or anything like that, but I do take issue with this specific instance because her character her bio clearly states that she's only 17 years old. Yikes. What bothers me even more about this is that the developers could have easily changed her age to be, you know, an adult, and her story would not have been changed in any way. Or they could have even saved this easter egg for a character that it's more suitable for, like Bloody Mary, who is an adult. It's bizarre. Thankfully, it seems that only a couple of videos exist online for this easter egg, but it's real. Okay, so that's the iceberg as I have it. If there are any entries that I should have included but didn't because I'm a hack and a fraud, you can tell me down in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed, and please take a moment to remember that you are worth it. Pain is a certainty in life, but suffering does not have to be. I hope you can find the things or people around you that make you happy, healthy, and kind, so that the pain of life doesn't have to mean suffering. Your darkest 
darkest moments don't define you and there's always a tomorrow. Take care of yourself out there and have a nice day.